Welcome everybody to uh, the sixth international workshop on uh, the microbiome in HIV. Uh, it's great to have you all here. It would be even greater to have you all in person so that we could uh, mingle and, uh, and um, meet each other in person. Um, but uh, on behalf of my co-chairs, uh, Dr. Alan Landy from Rush University and Grace Aldrovani from UCLA, welcome to this workshop. We're looking forward to having you here. In terms of numbers, we're going to have five sessions over two days. We have 11 invited lectures, eight oral presentations. We have two poster sessions that I'll encourage everybody to really take advantage of the poster sessions. Uh, we have abstracts submitted and we will have our poster presenters standing by to discuss the abstracts with you. We have 135 people registered for the meeting, which is um, uh, uh, not much different from when we have had our in-person meetings. So we're really excited about that. And our attendees represent 13 different countries. So it is indeed international. And thank you, our Australian uh, colleagues, for uh, being up in the middle of the night to join this meeting. We have 19 abstract submissions. The objectives of this meeting are to gather cross-disciplinary professionals in the field of the microbiome to provide a better understanding of the impact of the microbiome on host immunity and specifically to understand how it to understand how it impacts the pathogenesis of HIV across mucosal sites and to develop knowledge in the microbiome field based on the microbiome field to develop novel strategies for microbicides vaccines for HIV prevention and other aspects of ameliorating pathogenesis and disease so I'll encourage everybody to get involved. This really is um, meant to be participatory. Uh, please submit your questions to the live Q&A. Uh, the moderator for each session will be able to pose the questions to each of our speakers. And the more back and forth discussion, the more interesting and fun the meeting will be. Again, please visit the posters in the poster gallery. You can chat and connect with people through the meeting hub. And if you need technical support, there's a live support hub and we have our technical support uh, standing by to help with any potential technical glitches. The buttons for all of these um, functions should be available to you on your home page. So your feedback is really important. Each year, this is the sixth uh, workshop, each year we have received valuable feedback on the sessions and the speakers that have helped shape the follow-up uh, meetings. And so I would encourage all of you to take this seriously and please provide uh, uh, feedback through the session surveys uh, and participate in the general workshop evaluations after the event. So um, I want to acknowledge uh, uh, first the unseen people, uh, Federica and Kanchi, who put this all together. Uh, this is uh, a major organizational operation, and we're grateful to the Secretariat for everything that they've done. Um, uh, the organizational committee is listed up here. You will, I'm not going to introduce each of them, but you'll meet them as they chair each of the sessions as we work our way through the meeting. I also want to acknowledge the contributions of our scientific committee listed up here, and also the endorsers who provide academic support for this meeting. And then finally, for our um, industry sponsors who provide uh, financial support uh, for this meeting. So um, without further delay, uh, I want to introduce our uh, keynote speaker this morning. Uh, we are really fortunate uh, and delighted to have Dr. Elodie Geddon as our keynote speaker this morning. Dr. Geddon did her undergraduate degree and PhD in molecular parasitology at McGill University. She was then a postdoc at the NIH before jo joining the J. Craig Ventner Institute, followed by faculty positions at the University of Pittsburgh, and then NYU, where she led the Center for Genomics and Systems Biology. And then just this spring, in the middle of a pandemic, 
She moved to the NIH where she leads the systems genomics section at the Laboratory of Parasitic Diseases at NIAID. Dr. Geddon is a world leader in applying comparative genomics, evolutionary biology, and systems biology to understand host, host pathogen interactions. She studies microbial and viral population structures, and her work spans all components of the microbiome, including the virome, the fungal microbiome, and the bacterial microbiome. And she's particularly interested in viral diversity, emerging infectious diseases, and the microbiome of the respiratory tract and its impact on lung diseases. So we're excited to have Dr. Geddon here to talk to us about her work on the dynamics of phage bacteria interactions in the respiratory tract using metagenomics and metatranscriptomics. Without Good morning, everybody. I would like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me, and I'm excited to tell you about the new work we're doing on phage bacteria interactions. As you know, with the microbiome, what we're trying to capture is really the interactions of what is happening. Who is there? What is it doing? How does it react? And when does it really matter? In the work we do in my lab, we're very interested in the effect of pathogens on the disruption of the airway. And we've published a few papers that describe some of these studies. In one recent study, we actually looked at the interaction of fungus and bacteria and how these interactions can impact the airways. But one player that's important when we consider these interactions and the dynamics of the microbiome are phages. Now, if you know anything about phages is that they can have a very dynamic effect on their host. Phages can be beneficial to their host, uh, shuttling genes that confer some selective advantage. They can also kill their host and uh, promote competitors in the microbiome. And they're also important in capturing bacteria that will grow better with phages, or you can see expansion of phage populations. <clears throat> One aspect that is less often reported is the fact that phages can interact directly with the immune system. And I won't go into that specifically today, but it is interesting to see that they can interface with macrophages directly and in this way indirectly influence the immune cell activity. And in our studies, what we focus on is really the disruption of the upper airways and consequently what can be the lower airways with viruses like influenza and more recently SARS-CoV-2. There are commensals or normal uh, members of the microbiome in the respiratory tract that can become pathogenic because of the lack of competition as other microbes are disrupted because of the viruses. And it's that aspect that we try to capture when we look at the microbiome in the respiratory tract during viral infection. We've done a study with Aubrey Gordon uh, that is specifically on looking at influenza transmission within households. And these are uh, very nice data sets to work on uh, because we have a lot of information on the subjects on what antibiotics they take, how they interact with each other. And that's what's nice about having an influenza household transmission study. And we published a study earlier this year where we characterize antibiotic resistance genes using the meta transcriptome data. Now, this was a pilot study, and what we really wanted to do was to better understand transmission and whether influenza could lead to a higher transmission of antibiotic resistance genes or bacteria between individuals within a household. Because the main question we have is influenza disrupting the microbiome in such a way that it can even lead to transmission of pathogenic bacteria during a flu infection. 
To do this, we had access through Aubrey to even more samples within different transmission households. And what we call different transmission households is when you have an index case that has transmitted to every member of the household or to just a few members. And so we collected 10 different households, samples from all the individuals within these households for the analyses that I will show you today. Now, while our question was specifically, do we see higher transmission of influenza? What I'm showing you today is more, can we capture some dynamics of interactions between the phage and bacteria in these different households? And can we see any differences? Now, this was a feat uh, for the analyses. Lingdi Zhang, a fifth year PhD student in my lab, did all these analyses. She processed over 200 samples for both the RNA and the DNA. Samples came from 54 subjects and were collected at different time points. So that gives us also the ability to do some dynamic analyses. And what we do is the expression data, so from the metatranscriptome, and looking at abundance, but also at other aspects of the phages and the bacteria, specifically from that data. And that's what I want to discuss specifically with you today. Now, of course, the big question is, how is the microbial ecology impacted during flu infection? looking at microbial community, pathways, antibiotic resistance, but what about this bacteria-phage interactions? Now, the way to do this in a more standard approach is to do what are called enrichment analyses, and I'll describe what that is, or also looking at co-occurrence of bacteria and phages. If one is absent, is the other present, or are they both present at the same time? And that's another approach to look at interactions. So what do I mean by enrichment? Here in our analysis specifically of these samples, we have a representation of the metagenome in orange, the metatranscription in transcriptome in blue. And what you have here is differential abundance or differential expression based on whether flu is present in the sample or flu is absent. And you have as a control right here in the metatranscriptome, you see this very long line that indicates influenza virus, which we would hope to capture in the metatranscriptome data. But if I focus a little bit on the taxa that we do pick up as being differentially abundant or differentially expressed, we see here streptococcus, where at the abundance level, there is no difference between flu or no flu, but there is a difference in functionally how genes are expressed from these different species with a flu impacting this expression. And then we capture two phages that are differentially abundant. Now, from that type of data, we would infer that there's probably an interaction with some of these uh, uh, strep species and uh, strep phages. And we have, for example, one of these phages that is found at a high level in flu, while the other is present at a low level. And we can sort of infer the dynamics that happen there. But again, this is not a direct interaction. This is really inference from the enrichment data. Another way to look at these interactions is to look at co-occurrence networks. Now, a way to do this, here is an example of a study we published this year. Uh, it's not at all from flu data, it's from sewage data, work done by another PhD student in my lab, Kristin Golino. And here, using a tool that was actually developed to capture microbe metabolite interaction, Rich Bono's lab at NYU uh, decided to adapt it to phage and bacteria. And here what you can look at is whether any of the phages represented as red triangles here seem to be interacting with different types of bacteria. And if we focus on some of these interactions, you can see here on the left what you see with the triangle, you see crassphage, 
And crossphage is a newly discovered uh, phage that is known to be present in everybody's gut. So we find it a lot in the gut microbiome. And it here co-occurs with uh, bacteroides, which are known hosts of crassphage. And we can go into different sections of these networks and identify other phages. Here in this example, Lactococcus similarly is found in bacteria of the same phylum. So this is a way to do it also. But what I want to show you is how we can use the metagenomic data to look at direct interactions where we can link phages with their metagenome. So how can we do this? We can use the CRISPR system that is present in most bacterial species. Some species do not have a CRISPR system, but that system records the phage infection because any virus that has infected the bacteria will have some of its DNA or even RNA that ends up integrated into a CRISPR array. And it's represented here by a spacer. And the spacers that here are red, purple, and yellow represent pieces of the viruses that have infected the bacteria at some point in its history. So we're using that information specifically from the bacteria to then track back to the bacteria and phages that we find in our samples. This is the analytical pipeline. I've put in square brackets any of the tools that we've used, and it, this can be done in different ways, and this is the way we've done it. So basically, we take all the sequence reads at each time point for each individual, and we've actually pulled from the time points for each individual. And mine is filtered out with the human and ribosomal RNA reads. We then do a, an assignment of taxonomy using Kraken. So this is a tool that will tell you what is a bacterial read and give it a ta taxon and what is a virus read. In this case, we've used it to assign our bacterial reads and then we've assembled our bacterial reads into bacterial contexts to which we've assigned taxonomy. We've also used these bacterial reads to then run them through a tool called Metacrast that identifies these spacers in these CRISPR arrays. And we've used these spacers specifically to then map back to the bacterial context that we had and to map to the virus context that we've assembled in a slightly different way, but using a very similar approach to our bacterial reads. So now what we have is an active presence of these phages in our samples and look at whether any of these phages are present within the bacterial arrays, indicating in a dynamic way that there has been interaction at some point within these individuals. And so what we get from that are more than 1,500 phage host associations that we're able to capture across all our samples. When we talk about phage host interactions and we are interested in the microbial ecology, we can say, you know, what is happening in the respiratory tract? And you can have different types of structures. You can have what's called a nested structure of interaction or a modular structure. And what does that mean? In the nested, you have a hierarchy of infection and resistance of these bacteria to their phages. And you have some phages that are generalists, so a phage can infect multiple bacteria species, or you can have a specialist, and those are rarer, where you have one specific phage that infects one specific bacteria. In the modular structure, it's where you'll have an ecological framework that is basically specific interactions of bacteria and phages, but that form their own units. And what we see in the respiratory tract is actually a combination of both. So we see a modular structure, but within these modules, we have a lot of general generalists and specialists. So we have this internal nestedness. Now what that means specifically in the case of a flu infection is unclear, but we are seeing this interesting ecology or microbial interactions with their phages within the um, airways. 
So if we look at our subjects or individuals that were either infected or not infected with flu, and we specifically look at our bacterial taxa that you see here on the y-axis, and you see phages on the x-axis, we can then now look at how many individuals appear to have these interactions. And the color code is such that if you're dark purple, that means that interaction is found in many of the individuals for which we did the analyses. If it's gray, that means we found that interaction only in one individual. And what that shows you is that in most cases, we have a lot of unique interactions that we were able to capture. Now, many of the ones where we find conserved across individuals are known uh, bacteria such as Streptococcus and Prevotil and Neisseria that are known bacteria that we find in the upper airways. And so uh, we are seeing them pretty conserved across individuals with known phages that infect them. We were interested in comparing flu and no flu, and this is how our samples are, are sort of taken. We take all the samples at all time points from the not infected individuals. So these are our no flu households. We take only the infected time points for, from our infected households. And here I show the genus of the bacteria and the just the, the genus of what would be the phages for these interactions on the X and Y axes. Uh, and then what I've highlighted in red are specific groups of bacteria where we do see changes between no infection and infection. And if you see that there's Moraxella, which is the fourth one uh, that's highlighted, we see that in infection, Moraxella and the phages, we do find these interactions, which we don't find in the no infection. And you do see differences in number of, or the percentage of samples where we find these interactions. So this is just, you know, we're still doing a lot of analyses on this, but this shows you how there's far more resolution when you use your CRISPR arrays than when you just use your enrichment method and less you know, complicated than when you use your um, network um, interactions that we see from uh, the co-occurrence networks that we looked at. So from these analyses, what we've seen so far is that CRISPR arrays can be used to capture direct phage bacteria interactions. And what we saw is that these interactions in the airways appear to indicate high diversity and high availability of resources of the bacteria and their, their phages. And what we are starting to see at a better resolution is impact of influenza on the microbiome that we are detecting through these interactions. So I'd like to just acknowledge other people. Uh, I've mentioned Rich Bono and there are other members of his team that with whom we've worked on these interactions. And actually Rich and I co-mentor Ling Di Zhang who will be graduating in about six months. And Jahan Rahman is an undergraduate student who worked with uh, Ling Di and with Kristen on uh, the CRISPR arrays and identifying these interactions. I am now at the NIH, but I used to be at NYU uh, until last May. And so uh, most of the analyses were done and that study was done mostly at NYU. Thank you very much. Three, two, one. Great, well, Elodie, uh, thank you very much. That was, uh, that was great. Um, while people put questions in the chat, I think I'll lead off with the first question, uh, which is uh, one of the serious complications of influenza is bacterial superinfection. And so do you see any relationship in your flu um, studies between changes, particularly in pneumococcus and staphylococcus, staph aureus, which are the two uh, principal bacterial superinfections that complicate flu and actually lead to uh, mortality. Right, so um, there, we did pick up Staph aureus, but we didn't see any clear differentials 
expression or abundance between our conditions with the flu and no flu. And actually we were a little surprised. It was more at the streptococcus level. Um, and you know, this would be a way to capture it. Now I showed you the respiratory tract in the case of influenza, but right now we are actually analyzing the uh, bronchoalveolar lavage of patients with SARS-CoV-2. And there we are seeing a lot of differences with the staph aureus. So, uh, you know, obviously there's a more severity in this case. Now, in the case of flu, we haven't seen, um, uh, we've seen other, we've seen Maricela, for example, where there is enrichment in flu, but we haven't seen a lot of staph aureus. Great. Thank you. We have a question from Kathy Lozapon. Are you exploring longitudinal analysis to look at bacteriophage dynamics over time or at changes within individuals when they're infected versus not with flu? I guess a question really, are you seeing predator-prey relationships? Right, so that's what we did here was to look at flu, no flu. We had pooled our data uh, our time points with when, you know, ideally in all these microbiome studies is to have longitudinal data. Uh, it's often difficult to get. You can do it in the case of, you know, gut microbiome because you can collect stool. You can do it in upper airways because you can collect nasal swabs. But it's not always obvious to have access to this type of data. What we are doing now, what I'm, you know, what I decided to show you today was really an ongoing study. I, I don't like to present things that we've published already. And so I thought it'd be fun to show you what we can do with the phages. So we are, um, Catherine, we are doing right now the different time points. It's the technique to do that is what we did in our analysis is that to narrow the search space, we actually took all the time points that were flu positive, all the time points that were flu negative, and that's what we compared. And we pooled the data from these time points. And we only matched back our spacer sequences to contigs that we had assembled from the viruses that were actively in these individuals at any of the time points or any of the bacteria that were present at any of the time points. Now, the way to do it now is to take the spacers and not worry about whether we see the virus or not, but to really look at whether any of the spacers match to any virus in the database. And this will give us a better resolution at each time point. And I don't know if I made this more complicated, but it, it's really a, a, a way to process the data in a, in a different way so that you can parse it out. And that's what we're doing right now so that we can look over time at the dynamics of changes. Uh, because what happens with the phages and their bacteria is that it's actually a pretty rapid um, it's a, a pretty rapid interaction where you can build a CRISPR array relatively rapidly. Every time a bacteria is infected, it will integrate a piece of the, the, the phages into the, the genome, into this CRISPR array, and it builds this spacer over time. And so what we're trying to see is whether we can capture over time, any building of the spacer at these different time points. And incidentally, we're using right now these spacers as barcodes to look at transmission of bacteria. I don't know if Thank that you. answers your question, Catherine. It's a roundabout way. Thanks. We have a question from Adam Bergner. Have you assessed inflammation as a covariate in the analysis and how this might affect phage populations or interactions with the bacteria? So we don't have that data for these studies. Now these are um, household studies where they don't necessarily measure the inflammation, they just collect samples. Uh, so we don't have that data for these individuals. We do have it on our, SARS, our COVID studies where we do have inflammation. That's actually what we're looking at 
right now, we've just generated the phage bacteria uh, CRISPR array data, and we're, we're doing this now. Um, and so what we're, we're thinking is that there will be um, some um, correlations with inflammation, but we don't know. We have a question from Andrew Gustin. Have you detected any biases in your data due to sample processing or the enrichment process? So I'm not sure what you mean by biases. Do you mean biases in the bacteria we pick up? Or um, I'm trying to see what you mean by biases, if you want to put it in the chat. OK, while we wait for clarification on that, question. Uh, Shilpa Ray asks, with respect to staff, do you observe any MRSA in infected flu individuals? So to detect MRSA from metatranscriptomics or metagenomics data, you have to map it back to marker genes, which we haven't done for these individuals. We've done this for our COVID patients, and uh, we do see, but these were hospitalized patients, so we assume they're uh, acquiring it in the hospital. This is community uh, acquired flu uh, and transmission in the household studies. Uh, and so we haven't mapped back the staph aureus reads. Great, if, 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 if I can go back to the question about inflammation, um, are, are you looking at systemic inflammation or local mucosal respiratory tract inflammation or both? For the, for the SARS study you said, Ron? Yes. Yes, yeah, we're uh, looking specifically at the um, local inflammation in the mucosal, in the, from the, the BAL uh, data, from the BAL sample, from the sample. And right. also the systemic, so they are measuring it also from, uh, from the blood. So uh, Andrew clarifies his question by asking about biases biases towards specific viruses? So there will be, um, there will be biases simply because not all viral species or families have CRISPRs, CRISPR, the CRISPR system. Uh, and so there, we are losing some bacteria. And if you look at the literature on CRISPR arrays uh, or the, the CRISPR machinery, they say that, you know, it could be between, you know, 10 to 40% of bacterial families, if you look at you know, the wild world of phages uh, of bacteria, that the 10 to 40% do, um, do have a CRISPR system. So you are losing a lot of bacteria. So there, there is probably a bias in, in this way. Now we're not capturing everything with the metagenomics and metatranscriptomics we would no, you are, especially in the case of phages, although our sequencing was done at a very high depth, you are probably losing a lot of data. The advantage of this particular study is that we have multiple time points. So even if we lose data in one time point, we're hoping that we capture it at another time point. So that really helped us to get you know, quite a rich data set. Great. Um, well, that was a fantastic talk. Thank you for that. And uh, I think it's going to be incredibly exciting to see uh, what you find with uh, COVID-19. And it's just really fabulous to have this roadmap that you've developed with influenza to serve as a basis uh, for understanding the microbiome and its interaction with, uh, with SARS-CoV-2. Thanks, so, John. I see Kathy has, um, was asking about the human reads. So actually, we did not try using the metatranscriptomic data from the flu study. Uh, we did do it from the COVID study. Um, unfortunately, this is not stuff I could show you yet uh, because it's very actively ongoing. So there, the metatranscriptome reads, when they were filtered for human, the human reads were used to look at 
a host transcriptome in, in the lungs. So it is possible, you know, if, if anything, uh, if you get anything out of this uh, talk and discussion today is the fact that there's so much you can do with metatranscriptome, metagenome data. And here I gave you an example of flu because we had, you know, rich data, but this is totally applicable for uh, any studies, you know, studies on HIV and looking at the gut or any other uh, sample, sample set. Um, and with the metatranscriptome, you can... Um, you know, when you think about it, there's also the fungal part, even the meta, you know, the fungal part that, you know, I haven't even, we haven't even looked at, frankly. Uh, we've only looked at the viruses and the bacteria at this point. Great. Well, thank you very much. Um, our time is at, uh, is at a close. And um, the next session will start back at uh, 1045 Eastern time sharp. So translate that into whatever your, your time zone is. Uh, thank you, uh, Elodie, and we'll see you all back in uh, about nine minutes. Thank you. Thanks.